Welcome back to Ox Tools, I'm Tom. So, uh, working on another meatloaf episode. Um, I managed to catch my wife's cold, um, but it's not too bad. I just have a stuffy head. Uh, I can still work in the shop, so don't worry. Uh, there'll be some entertainment value here. Um, we're going to continue working on the uh, lathe DRO install, um, the Z axis uh, on the machine. We've got it all mounted up. Now I have to uh, do some aligning on it and then mount the reed head and the, the protective cover. So that's actually getting pretty close. Um, got some stuff in the mail that we're gonna look at, some really interesting things. So uh, these are uh, things sent in by viewers and I really appreciate it and uh, it's gonna be very entertaining because there's some cool stuff. Um, and um, I don't know, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what else will be in here. Just read the description and you'll kind of know what's in there. And don't forget, you can always do the uh, keyword search there in the YouTube videos and, um, and find different subjects. So I put a lot of keywords in uh, so guys can find specific things, in particular these episodes that have a, a mix of subjects. So um, let's go look at some stuff and uh, let's do some work. Okay, so here's, um, we're uh, fiddling around with the, uh, these adjusters that adjusts this flat bar in relation to the back of the machine here. And I just wanted to show you guys these things. And I call these uh, concentric uh, adjusters. So the idea is, um, there they're installed. Now this is the side that sits against the machine here. So, you know, I expect this casting to be kind of, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit wonky there. So what this allows me to do is, is make a contact foot that I can adjust without shimming um, till it's bearing properly and then I can push I can push the flat bar away if I need to or I can pull it down and you, could, you might ask well gee how's he gonna pull it down with that right well um, let me flip it down here so here's you know, here's one of the things and it's just a fully threaded silicon bronze bolt um, with the head thinned a little bit so I can still get it with with a thin Cap it wrench here. Okay. So let me flip this down. So the idea then, screw, screw please, here we go, is this screw passes through the center here, and that one isn't quite long enough, but uh, we'll find one. So what I can do is I can I can pull this down so that it's always in contact with that, and then I can make adjustments here. Okay, and I can lock the whole mess down so it's always bearing against that, but it's firmly locked. Okay, so anyway, that's what I call a concentric adjuster. And the mounts, the other mounts are, are similar, but they're kind of flush. Uh, they're just uh, slightly different there. Um, anyway, that's how that works. So we're going to put this back up. I've got four holes drilled in tap now, so I can hang this thing and get it in position, and I can drill the rest of these holes. And, uh, and then we can start uh, indicating this and uh, truing it up real nice. So that's what we're doing.
slack in that a little bit. But what I can do is I can adjust this, and what it's actually doing is it's, it's moving the bar. It's still sitting against there. The screw holds it against that, and then I can just make my adjustments. Hold that, bink, and that's locked. Anyway, that's how that works. Okay, so after a bunch of screwing around here, <coughs> excuse me, um, I've got this trued out here now. Um, I had added, well, I had my original mounts here, 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 and then on the very end down here. Anyway, I wasn't able to get it trued up um, as good as I wanted um, with just those adjusters. So I added another set right here, and I added another set here, kind of mid-span between these two mounts here. Anyway, I was getting some, some wiggle, and you know, when you pull down over here, it pops out over there. Anyway, it's, you chase your tail back and forth for a while, but it's tight. It's all tight right now, and, um, and it's true. So now I can now I get this nice true surface here. I can stick the scale on, and I don't have to I don't have to screw around at all. I just mount the scale, and then I just trim the scale out for this direction, which is relatively easy. Um, and then uh, it has some little clamps to uh, hold the scale uh, in a few places here. These little M4s to hold it in. Anyway, it took a little while. It's was you know some intensely boring video me running back and forth they really could have used Chuck's help uh, cranking on the other side because uh, I had to go back and forth back and forth back and forth and anyway it's a big pain in the neck but it's it's cool it's done and uh, what I'll do is I'll put the camera on the carriage here and you guys can take a little ride and, uh, and go down the uh, go down the length of it so I think I got about so the spec is about um, a tenth of a millimeter per meter um, so they allow a little bit of wander, um, and um, but you know we don't want it to keep drifting one way. What we want is we want kind of a drift that's about uh, a mean uh, position. So what we want is kind of plus or minus. Um, um, and I think I can't remember where I'm at now, but uh, you'll see in just a second. So uh, I'm going to run that down and uh, we'll mount the scale. In the reed head, and da da da, we're in business. Okay, you guys ready? Here we go. And you can see it's floating back and forth around the zero, which is good. And this is the worst spot right there, which is about four. And doom, that's it. End of travel. Okay, so got the cover on and um, got the uh, the reed head cable uh, strain relief here and brought up to um, you know so that it comes together with the uh, the X axis here. Now these will. These are just temporary right now, uh, so I can test the unit. So I got uh, plugged them into the box. So we're going to do a uh, calibration test here and see uh, if everything's working properly. So it's all aligned. Everything should be happy. Uh, cross your fingers, I hope. And uh, so let's move the camera, and uh, we'll uh, go around the other side, and we'll do the do the calibration test. Okay. So I'll get the cables connected. Let's plug this sucker in. Feels about right, um, you know. Turns relative to measurement. So let's uh, put this on here. And what we're 
we're going to do is just check it against the indicator and see if, uh, oops, see if it makes sense. travel here. This is the uh, five micron scale, also. So uh, I don't know if I like that. No. Well, I need to uh, measure it over some longer distances. I think so. settings in the box here, um, I probably have to set this one to um, the 5 micron scale, so I may have, I think you can set them differently, so I'm going to look in the book and, uh, and try that. Okay, so I, I figured out what my problem was. Um, I had just kind of willy-nilly put this uh, indicator up, and I had it cocked just a little bit uh, at a slight angle, and you know, it's actually pretty hard to get kind of dead nuts, uh, straight. But um, once I looked at that and corrected it, uh, it reads much closer. Uh, this correlates with the, uh, the DRO display there. So if this is pitched at a little angle or whatever in that direction or that direction, it won't, uh, um, it won't, it won't read right. <laughs> so you get a parallax error is what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, I'm happy now, the scale's set properly, and uh, time to move the lathe back. Okay, so I managed to get the lathe back in position myself. Uh, wasn't too bad. Uh, when Chuck and I moved it out uh, before, we put some witness marks on the floor so we could put it back, get the corners right in the same spot, because this is not part of the lathe there. So. Anyway, I managed to wrestle it back in there. It's not leveled yet, so I'm not going to do that just yet. Um, that's going to be another episode because that's a whole, whole special deal. So we'll get the level out and uh, we'll level this thing up, and then we'll uh, we'll take a test cut and see what we get with the test cut and uh, go with that. So we're sitting on new feet. I put new feet underneath it. Um, the reason for the new feet is. At higher RPM, there was a little uh, a little vibration in the lathe that I didn't really like. Um, you can feel it. Um, you know, this thing should be pretty much rock steady at any speed. Um, so I wouldn't run it typically in the higher RPMs. Uh, now that I'm on some proper steel feet, you know, with a big footprint, I think we're going to be okay. So we'll get that leveled out. We'll get all the feet bearing uh, roughly uh, equally. 
uh, bearing, you know, weight-wise, um, sharing their load, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, travel dial came off. That's going to a friend of mine. Uh, he needs a uh, position indicator for his little lawn lay. Um, the RO works. I think we're back in business here. Okay. So the first thing we got here, um, we got a little, uh, this, this comes to us from uh, Joe Hale, and he's out in uh, Florida. And uh, he and I uh, have been going back and forth on these mini pallets. He built one himself. And um, uh, Joe's a, uh, uh, he's an engineer at a company that makes uh, uh, fasteners. And they do uh, rolled threads and cut threads and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, uh, he and I have been kicking around some stuff, and uh, I sent him a a Pratt and Whitney lathe manual, and um, he uh, he's going to convert it into PDF. So, um, if anybody needs a uh, Pratt and Whitney manual, um, maybe we'll uh, we'll figure out how to get you a Pratt and Whitney manual. Anyway, he sent me some goodies here, <clears throat> and we'll go through the box here. <laughs> There's some cool stuff here. Um, so this is the first thing, this is the little letter here. Um, and we're talking about some mini pallet clamps that have a, a small dowel pin sticking out the front for uh, a, a very small contact point for holding um, small items uh, um, with these pallet, pallet clamps. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so he sent me a little <laughs> assortment of dowel pins there. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, next thing here is he's got uh, um, concrete machine screws. Let's pull those out here. Um, so these are combination uh, screws here. Let's pop them out of the bag and uh, look at them. And what they are is <clears throat> they drill into the concrete, but they have a machine screw thread on the outside, and then there's a little little hex driver on the end there. And you know, being a thorough, typical engineer, he sent me a drill bit too. So <laughs> I love it. Anyway, those are kind of cool. Uh, these are pretty heavy duty ones here. You can screw them into concrete and then, you know, mount something uh, pretty studly to the wall. So thanks for those, Joe. Um, you know, fasteners are always cool. And then, um, you know, he, he watched the, uh, the video on um, the new uh, lathe backing plate uh, for the four jaw. So he sent me a, a little handful of these, uh, these elevator, <coughs> excuse me, elevator bolts. Um, to put in that, and, and then these sit against the uh, um, the chuck and uh, have a nice flat surface on them. So he sent me those. So thanks again, Joe. And um, let's see what else. Let's look at this, look at this letter here. Um, oh, <laughs> this is cool. So this is some dry rub that he makes um, um, for barbecuing here. Okay, Daddy Fatty's Red Dirt Rub, good for all critters, um, yard birds. Oinkers, moors, possums, just rub it and let it sit a spell, preferably overnight, and you, oh, in your ice box. So we're going to try that out and um, uh, on some critters. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, my my nose is no good right now, or I'd open it up and uh, and give it a little whiff there and see what it smells like. But uh, I'll probably go into a hacking fit there. <laughs> anyway, thanks for that. We're gonna we're gonna test drive that on the barbecue. Um, and then the last thing is uh, he sent some bearings and shoulder bolts because um, what he did with his mini pallet here um, is uh, he put some bearings and shoulder bolts so that he could kind of convert it into a sign plate, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, I haven't really looked at doing that on mine because I usually set it with kind of an angle block. Uh, and I don't generally use my mini pallet for super precise angles, although you can. Um, it just depends what you're doing. Okay. Anyway, so he sent me a little handful of handful of bearings and uh, shoulder bolts. So thanks again, Joe. Appreciate that. All right. Oop. Moving on. Okay. So the next thing, this this envelope here, and you can see it's you know looks like just a regular envelope, and it's it's nice and flat and uh, um, nothing weird looking about it. Well, this came in a box. Um, you know. A priority mailbox, uh, you know, roughly eight inch cube, right? And I'm like, so I, the box is real light. I open it up and uh, and I go, what what's going on here? It's got a it's got an envelope inside it. It's like, what's what's the deal? And why'd they put an envelope inside the box, right? And uh, so I take my knife and you know I open up the uh, um, the 
or the envelope, and I almost screw up the screw the pooch here. See that it, my my knife went into the into the letter there and started cutting it. And you're going to see why this is a problem in just a second here. So this comes from a viewer back in uh, Michigan. Uh, his name is Chuck, and uh, he's a uh, an engineer that uh, that does. Um, um, combustion engine design. So uh, uh, he's an interesting cat and uh, actually there's two of them. There's two cohorts back there. One's named Jay and one is named Chuck and they're they're in cahoots with one another. So they watch my videos and then they go to work and uh, and then they, uh, they they compare notes and uh, and then throw up comments for me to <laughs> to answer. Anyway uh, what you're gonna see here this is very special here. Look at this. Now Hopefully you can see that because that's a hammer. <laughs> All right, it's a little tiny ball peen hammer, and we're gonna we're gonna pull it out of there and look at it. Okay. Um, anyway, he's got this nice letter here, and, I, and I'm not gonna read the whole uh, um, the whole letter here, but uh, it's it's pretty good. So uh, um, let's 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 look at this thing here, and you know, and look at this. This is right where I was cutting, right? You know, so if I would have broke that, I would have been like pissed. <laughs> All right, let's set this aside here. We're going to now see if I can get it out of here with that without screwing screwing this up here. Oh, come on. All right. Well, we're going to we're going to do it the safe way here. Let me cut that open and then let that out of there. Look at that. Is that cool? <laughs> Look at that thing, man. It's El Dinky. So now, okay, I got it. this is the smallest one here. All right, this is the smallest one I have, and it looks like he just made it with with needle. Oh my God, look at that! It's got little. I don't know if you can see that. It's got little, like little wedges in it or something, right? Or what looks like little wedges. <laughs> the detail is excellent. So uh, and it's pretty small. Now it's. It's very well proportioned too, so hopefully you can see that. Let me, I'm just going to set it down on there and I'll just poke it around with that. So let's, we're going to trot out all the other little hammers here too and we'll do a little uh, kind of a style comparison here. So this is first one I got. Let's see, uh, the second one I got. Let's see, let's put them in order here. Hopefully you can see. And the third one is the Swedish hammer. So I'll put that down. Okay, and then the Florida hammer here. Okay, and then now the Michigan hammer. So we got this is California hammer, Texas hammer, Swedish hammer, Florida hammer, and the Michigan hammer. So let's see, we gotta get that in the frame there. Oop, bloop. Anyway, that's that's fantastic. Now just take a look at these, okay? And just look at them from a proportion standpoint, okay? Um, you know, of a normal hammer, right? So if we look at this one here, the hammer's a little thick, or the handle's a little bit thick and a little bit short in relation to the head, right? Okay. Now we jump up to this one, and this one's actually proportioned pretty well here for the the head size, uh, this thickness here, and then the handle diameter. Okay. So this one's proportioned pretty well. And then we jump to this one. Uh, the Swedish hammer here, and the handle's a little bit short and a little bit thick, okay? It, and then this is just stylistic. It's not a criticism. Um, I'm just pointing some things out from a kind of a stylistic design point, okay? And then we look at this one here, and it's pretty good. The length's about right, but it's kind of a skinny handle, okay? So proportionally slightly off. Then we look at this guy here, and I think Chuck nailed it here pretty good. You know, the handle diameter, the length versus head size is 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 right there. He's he he hit it good. Um, and like I said, no, no slight against the rest of the guys. I love all this stuff. This is like really killer, man. I, this is so exciting. But I'm just so glad I didn't cut this in half when I opened the uh, when I opened the darn uh, <laughs> the darn envelope. Anyway, thanks, Chuck. Appreciate that. And uh, he's looking for a surface grinder, and he's back in Michigan. So if any of you guys are in uh, Michigan out there and you got a surface grinder you don't want, uh, Chuck's looking for one, and uh, I can uh, put you guys in touch with one another. So, okay. 
Okay, this next one comes to us um, from a guy, uh, his name is Mark Warner, and uh, what Mark has is he has a, um, a little problem with a lock. Now, uh, what Mark uh, did was uh, he emailed me and uh, asked if I might be willing to build this on camera as part of a meatloaf episode, and you know, it's got some interest, uh, but um, what I said, what I suggested instead was, um, hey, are you up for a challenge uh, making this yourself? And he says, well, gee, I don't have a lot of equipment, you know. And uh, so he's got, a, he's got a drill press and some sanders and uh, grinders and files and hand tools, but he doesn't have a lathe or a mill. And what he wants to make, and I, I printed the pictures out. He sent me a couple pictures and a little, uh, little chicken sketch. So th this is what he wants to make. And it's some, it's some part out of a lock. Uh, I'm not clear what the lock is. Um, and frankly, I'm not clear what's wrong with this particular one here. Um, so it's a, it's a cast zinc part or something like that. It's, you know, pop metal, you know, whatever. Um, and then it has this little tricky uh, square hole through it here. And, uh, you know, it's some piece of a lock here, all right? So that's, that's the, the, the better picture. And then here's kind of a side view of it here, like that. So it's cylindrical. It's uh, turned down a little bit here, turned down a little bit here. It's got a square hole running through it. Then it's got this, this arm bit, um, you know, coming off the side, all right? So then uh, here's, his, here's his little, uh, here's his sketch. And he gives some he gives some dimensions here. Like I said, I'm not uh, I'm not clear what the uh, what the problem is with this one, or if he just pulled this out of a drawer and said, "Gee, uh, Tom might like making this." <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, I'm not going to make it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give him some ideas on how he could make it. Okay. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a little bit of sketching and. Um, uh, we're going to do a little bit of talking and uh, and throw some ideas down that uh, that Mark Warner can uh, can use in his garage with his limited tools to uh, um, to make this piece here. All right, so I'm going to show two possible scenarios here that uh, that he could uh, he can make this uh, how he could make this here. Um, so the first is um, you can saw this out of a monolithic block, right? Uh, for example, um, let's say you had a you had a block like so, okay? And we'll, we're just going to draw the piece um, in the block here, okay? And there's a square there, and then um, you know the the Mickey Mouse ears coming out like that. Like that, okay. And then if we we roll the block over on its side here, we're like so, okay. And um, and let's see, like that, okay. Now there's this, there's the neck down part, and then we come in, and then here's the Mickey Mouse ears like so, okay? And then it's got the hole through like that, okay? So what you can do here is if you have a block that this thing will be encased in is you, you know, you would take a saw cut down like this, okay? And this can be a hacksaw or a sawzall or whatever, and you take a saw cut down like that, and then you would cut in this way, and then this whole piece kind of comes out. And same thing here, we make a cut along there, we make a cut along there, and this whole piece comes out too, okay? And then what you can do is now make successive cuts um, along, you know, along the cylindrical part. Now you would lay all this out on the block to start with, I, if that wasn't obvious, um, but uh, I'll just say it just in case, okay? All right. And then you would just make successive saw cuts like so around this down to this level, okay? So to basically what you're doing is you're making a polygon out of that 
down to this level, right? So this is basically kind of round, okay? Then you flip it over and you do the same thing here. Well, that's a lot of sawing and that's a lot of horsing around. And then this thing doesn't end up very round, okay? So that's, that's one way, that's one way of doing it, okay? Uh, so you need a block and you need a, some good hacksaw blades and, uh, and some patience to, uh, to do this. So you could do it that way. Uh, that's probably not how I would attack this particular job. So uh, what I'm going to do is let's get rid of this and then I'm going to show uh, how, um, how the better, what I think is the better way to attack this problem. So, All right, so this is going to be method method two here. Um, all right, so let's do a little ISO sketch here. Now this is the cylindrical part of it, and then this square goes down through like so. All right, <clears throat> and then what um, what we have? Uh, so I what I'm proposing is we handle the cylindrical part separately from the uh, the Mickey Mouse ears here, like that. Oops, uh, my sketch is going sour there. that up a little bit something like that and then, right. okay and then so you make this out of a piece of flat material okay that's the right thickness and then you make this out of a cylindrical piece. Hopefully uh, you can find something that has the same diameter. And, uh, and then what we do is we, we cut a little registration notch like that in here. Okay, and then this, that would go in there and you would soft solder that or hard solder that in place. Okay, and uh, so this piece is, it's much, excuse me, much simpler to handle and then this piece is kind of a standalone that you can make out of some uh, some flat stock, okay? All right, now this this can all be done with hand tools here. This can all be done with hand tools. Now, the the crux or the, the I would call it the tricky part of the uh, of the whole thing is this uh, is the square here, all right? And um, in this case it's uh, uh, it's about three sixteenths of an inch square, and it's all the way through. So how to do that, right? Um, so you could drill a hole, you know, you could drill a round hole, and then you could file the corners out and and do that. But that's uh, that's an exercise in frustration. I think I have a better idea that I'm going to throw out here. So um, let's see, do I have enough room here on the paper here? Um, yeah, let's just go for it here. So what I'm going to suggest here is, let me scoot this over, is instead of trying to make a square there, um, if you go to the hobby store, you can get um, you can get square brass tubing, okay? And McMaster Car also sells it too. Um, it's thin wall brass tubing, like so, okay? And you can get it that has a 316 ID. Okay, and then the OD is, I, th I looked it up, it's, uh, I think it's 732 uh, OD. Okay, so now his, you know, the ID of this tube is correct for the, uh, for the lock. So what we do is instead of putting a square hole through that, we put a round hole through the center. And he can do this, you can mark, you can do this on your drill press. You know, you lay out carefully and you drill carefully. Um, you can uh, you can get a nice straight hole through that, okay. And uh, what we're going to do is, if if you look down at the top of it here, we're going to drill a hole, a round hole, that's that's big enough, okay. 
that it fits the, the corners, okay? So it fits the corners of this 732, right? So if you look at this, your 732, it's this diagonal distance, right? Okay, so if that's, uh, let's see, what is 732? Um, 0.218, okay, and that's 0.218. So if you take 0.218 and you multiply it by 1.414, right, which is the square root of 2, it, um, what is that? Um, it's point, uh, it's point 0.3 something, okay. So you're going to drill a hole um, that's equal to this diagonal distance here, okay, and then, so now you have a round hole through here. You're going to slip this tube down into your round hole and orient it properly, and then you can just solder that in place when you got it when you got it correct. Now, my advice for when you solder when you get to soldering that is you leave this this tube a little bit long and it's it's actually hanging out here on either end. Oops, my sketching is going off the cliff here. You leave it a little long on e on each end. Uh, when you do your soldering and then the last thing you do is after it's all nice and soldered is you cut that off and you address the ends. That way you're not spilling solder into the ID of the tube or anything like that. But you got to get the orientation right too. So I'm going to throw up some part numbers. Um, oh, uh, one last thing is I, I did look up some, um, um, you know, to buy some materials to do this. So I have a part number, for, oops. I got a part number for the tube. I got a part number for a piece of stock um, for this cylindrical part, and then I have a part number for the uh, the flat material for that. And it's all pretty cheap, you know. It's uh, you know it's about twenty five dollars worth of stuff. And then he's got soldering gear and uh, and things like that. Um, so um, anyway, uh, um, that's one way you could do that. Now the well, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna switch the video around and get a fresh piece of paper here. Okay, so the last bit here is uh, you know how to make that cylindrical part, right? So what he's what he's got to make is a uh, thing that looks like this. Um, okay, it's got two smaller diameters on it, and then it has a hole all the way through. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna make that out of a bolt, uh, a brass bolt. Okay, so I'm going to give you the part number for this, for a hex bolt that looks kind of like that, right? And then what you're going to use, you're just going to chop out this, uh, this straight section here like this, okay? And that's going to become this part right here. So I'm going to give you that part number for that bolt. Now that bolt, I couldn't find, uh, it's a 7 16 diameter roughly that he needs. Um, I couldn't find a 7 16 bolt in brass that had uh, a straight shank on it like that. So this one is actually half inch diameter, okay? So you're gonna have to turn this diameter down, okay? Which is okay because now you'll be, uh, uh, you're gonna put your center hole in first, okay? This center hole through here and then you'll do this OD and then you'll do these little, uh, these little sections here. And one way you can do that is if you take a piece of angle like this, okay? All right, and then you're gonna put a hole here like so, and a couple holes here, and then another one. All right. All right, so this is gonna be your, uh, your kind of your, your lathe bed, right? So what I would do is I would put a rod through these, okay, through your part, so, and then screw this to a piece of plywood or something like that, right? Screw that to a piece of plywood. And now you can run this with your drill motor, okay? And then you can just put a file on here zzz, and go back and forth with a file. And you could even put a tool rest here, you know, to hold the file nice and straight and everything. So you're spinning this thing and now you can make this nice uniform cylinder and you can make these nice uniform shoulders okay just by spinning that between that you know so that you can put a little bit of pressure on it okay 
and you can put a piece of all thread through here with a with a nut, you know, like this. Okay, and then you know you're just gonna you're just gonna spin that with your drill, and then you're just gonna remove some of that material to make the proper size cylinder there. Okay, so you're gonna cut the bolt off, drill a hole through it first, and then pile it on that hole um, so that everything is concentric with the, the hole that you put through. Otherwise, it's too hard to make the center hole concentric with the OD. So uh, do the OD second, okay? Anyway, that's, uh, uh, that's for Mark Warner. A um, few minutes of, uh, of, a, of a possible couple methods that, uh, that you could use to make that part and uh, with limited tooling. And Mark, I hope you, uh, you follow up and go ahead and make this piece and shoot some pictures of it. Um, and if you shoot some pictures of it, I'll put them up on a video and, uh, and uh, show how you, uh, how you did this. So this was my challenge to Mike Warner was uh, a couple of ways that you could possibly do this and, um, um, and get this done with, without a lathe and without a mill and just basic hand tools. Okay? All right. Hope you like that.